Olha Muka is a culturologist, academic editor and compiler, project manager and curator in the sphere of culture, education, civic rights and freedoms activist. She was born in Lviv, which many of you will know, I visited for the first time recently, so I'm sure we'll touch upon that. Uh, so what's your role in PEN? You're... In PEN, in PEN I am, uh, I'm responsible for, let's say, mostly international membership and everything what is linked with, doing PEN congresses, all the committees linked to businesses, but also a guiding development of new centres all around the world. And Olha is very closely involved with PEN, and we'll put a link into the video. She's done an absolutely brilliant series of many dozens of extraordinary interviews with some of the sharpest and most interesting thinkers on world politics, but also Ukrainian culture and the current situation. Welcome to the channel. It's an absolute delight to be able to speak to you. Yeah, thank you, John. John. That's a pleasure on my end. Well, I, I have to make an admission here. I discovered your incredible materials just a couple of weeks ago. I've started to binge on them, but there's so much to get through there. That uh, really is my sort of podcast consumption for the next uh, probably couple of months. Um, but uh, I'll let you know when I've run out and you have to uh, increase the pace of recording. <laughs> well, what can I tell about that? I mean, that obviously that was, this is a long, more than a long year, year long project. And we gathered over fee, over 80 uh, guests from Ukraine, but also international intellectuals, politicians, writers, very different level. And I think that what is incredibly important is that I still remember our first dialogue, first episode, that was March 1st, 2022. It was literally, you know, within a week after everything started. And when it was still very difficult to call spade a spade, especially for the Western people, when we still had a long discussions about, should we call it like dialogues on war? Should we use the word, right? So, and this is a great diary on monitoring how things were developing. And I'm really happy to tell you that what I felt that at the very beginning, let's say at the first initial two months, that would be mostly quite scared and very careful, caring questions like, how are you? How are things doing? Like, are you, like how does it look? How does it feel? Mm. Are you living it out? And then probably on the in a couple of months, we came to the level of some kind of analysis, but still, uh, there was quite challenging in terms of analysis on Ukraine, not analysis from this, you know, through Russian lens, through just like, what is going to, what, what do you think about Putin? I was like, I don't think about Putin. <laughs> He's not our leader. He's somebody else's <laughs> leader. <laughs> no, I mean, that just to deliver this point of view, you can't speak about Ukraine without Ukrainians. That was quite challenging thing to deliver, even to the very, very open and, you know, just focus on human rights, inclusivity, and all the BBC standards, <laughs> international community. So uh, that's, uh, that's a journey. And probably only in half of a year of this regular conversation, we came to the point of uh, like why things happen in that way, what's next. And within eight or nine months, people starting to people started to ask questions like, what can happen after you win? Mm. That's it. <laughs> we reached the point, right? And uh, they were, they were very, very different conversations, very different dialogues, and asking mostly quite provocative questions and not comfortable, especially in Western minds, let's say. And um, But where we would always end our conversation that if you ask yourself as an intellectual from any place in the world, like, what can I do today? What is the message I can share? What is uh, 
uh, the first source opinion, how we can use this primary source and uh, where are the limits of solidarity and what is our shared responsibility today? So, yeah, I, I'm really kind of envy you that you haven't <laughs> Uh, enjoyed yet all the conversation they're definitely some of my favorites but and of course when you get into a project like this uh, you have I guess for want of a better word a hit list of people that you would like to speak to and and some of those people um uh, in my case you know they, they would have been books that I had on the shelf people I've admired from afar from a you know a considerable amount of time and then you're you're suddenly speaking to them. Suddenly you have to ask them intelligent questions. And uh, certainly in my case, there's a certain amount of imposter syndrome because I I, I didn't go into academia. I didn't carry on with uh, you know either sort of literature or history that I studied at university and uh, you know from a, from a young age. Um, and some of those conversations are sort of thrilling. Some of the conversations naturally are perhaps a little disappointing if uh, I won't say which ones are which um, but for me I think the most thrilling thing uh, of the last year and a half has been talking to Ukrainians and really starting to dive behind the nuances of the Moscow lens and um, I know you've had this challenge as well of getting speakers to to look beyond the influences uh, that Russian soft power has had. And then you start to realize, of course, that this isn't accidental. This is a conscious projection of soft power and Russian narratives, uh, and not just in Putin, but over decades, if not centuries. Um, so what have been the, the sort of challenges and the learnings for you over the last year and a half? Well, there are plenty of those. And if you are talking about like, the Russian narratives and countering them, that's definitely one of the biggest one because mostly people would come to the both topics. It doesn't matter if it's Russia or Ukraine through the very, very basic stereotypes. And uh, it took a while for people just to recognize that Ukraine is quite a huge country on the map. And this is a separate country and the language is different. And the history is different. And even through the uh, history, like that's one of the biggest disappointments for me personal here in the UK, when you open Britannica and then check that Ukraine starts its history based on the Britannica approach in 1991st and not as a cave roofs, right? So, and this is a completely outcome of this so-called soft power you're referring to. For us, that was a huge challenge to find people not to speak through this Russian lens, definitely. Because even if I would try to keep the conversation to narrow it within the Ukrainian question, I would always be like, but what's, what, what do Russians think about that? <laughs> like, yeah. I basically don't care here and now in this conversation. Can we try to reshift it a bit? It wasn't too easy for some of our guests, honestly. And the internal dynamic of those conversations was also very different. And you're completely right that sometimes the guests, you would expect a lot of empathy or probably a bit deeper digging or the level of analysis, they would be quite quite shallow, mostly emotional in their approach, right? And uh, another big challenge would be but also opposite too. Like you were like, okay, this is a quite, a, you know, just a legendary guy who has nothing to do with Ukraine. So probably how could he know? It mentioned already uh, Fukuyama, who knew like all the cave tube stations in Didos, <laughs> all the streets when they changed their names, <laughs> and all the background behind that. That was that was very impressive and very reassuring, I should say. Another big challenge was also like beside getting people to speak about these things, it's just calling spade a spade especially Western intellectuals, um, they they kind of used to beat around the bush. 
And in the better cases, they would just rub things in paper, saying things nicely, trying not to be too sharp. And with a, a number of them, it was even difficult to get them to use the war word, just to call it not the conflict, but actual mm -hmm. war. And um, we never wanted our dialogues to turn out into the lecturing <laughs> in terms of, you know, just promoting Ukraine. This is how things were developing. But also for us, that was a great case study in terms of that we gathered such a different opinions. And sometimes those were completely unexpected. And I think that it got us to know and also to shape our communication a bit. I also worked a lot with the international communication, where the building international image of Ukraine on a different levels and different level of professional comms, but also as a party of Ukrainian diaspora here in London. But yeah, I think that I still need a lot of time to process all of the learnings <laughs> and probably as they use as an academic just to get into some statistic in terms of reach or the real, real outcomes of that. Well, for me, it, it, it felt almost like sort of going back to school and uh, obviously having read a lot of Russian literature uh, when I was younger in translation and then being able to read it in the original later on uh, and studying Russian history since the age of 14. Um, you have to make a conscious effort, or at least I think many uh Russianists ought to make a conscious effort to unlearn and relearn everything they knew. And for me, the process has involved creating almost like a dictionary of Russian narratives. You now, rather than trying to interpret things through some kind of, you know, realist geopolitical lens, I get almost like sort of literature and marketing, actually. And this is a even though, uh, you know, I, I was complaining about the day job before we started, uh, it's actually rather good, I think, to look at things dispassionately and say, OK, well, let's just see what stories are out there. Let's see which stories are organic uh, and and have, you know, multiple narratives and variations and iterations and which stories seem to be reoccurring over and over and seem to lack that organic quality behind them. And then ask the question, well, have they been created? Have they been seeded into the information sphere? And what is the point of doing that? Who benefits? What is the strategic objective? So, yeah, I've been creating a sort of a, almost like a, a playbook or a storybook of narratives, um, almost completely divorced from history, but examine them as to whether these are intentional narratives or not. And I think once you start to do that, then you start to look at the so-called experts, whether they be military experts or not. And almost immediately, you get a clear idea. You know, you might have two experts speaking with the same authority, but one is compiling narratives that he's sort of seen and heard and whatever, and not deconstructed them. You know, that someone is, is um, recycling the information uh, rather than creating it. Whereas other speakers, uh, you think, oh my goodness, you know, they've, they take in whatever they see, they break it down, they question everything, and they then build it back up into their own picture of the world. And I found myself only going for guests on the channel who do that. I'm not a journalist, so I can say, right, well, I don't want to talk to that person because I don't respect their point of view. I'm only going to invite on people who uh, who I think are going to be interesting and seem to have that sort of original process. So I don't know what your experience there is because you've you've got some incredibly high profile uh, guests, but did you get the sense that some of them were, um, I would say, sort of uh, you know rehashing information rather than uh, you know creating an original uh, picture of the world? Sadly, yes. And obviously, I can't uh, just you know call the names, but I mean yeah. that sometimes I would be absolutely unexpected from people who have such a range of uh, really high intellectual profile, rather to be translators of the same narratives. But also, I just wanted that, that's a funny thing. Like just analyzing your small speech before you ask this question, you said Russian seven or eight times 
and you never said Ukrainian. And this is the biggest problem. <laughs> this is the biggest problem because we keep speaking about Ukraine without actually Ukraine in it. We keep speaking about, we keep repeating the same narratives. We keep thinking how it looks through the lens of Russia. How does it work? Why it's been created? When? How? And then like, I asked a couple of my guests, like, can we just start talking about Ukraine, actually? Because this is the core of it. And this is a quite significant issue about all those conversations. And I think that in terms of uh, guests, that was also very important for us that we created pairs, right? The one person from Ukraine, the original source, and the other person as uh, international introduction, yeah, from all around the world. And um, they were obviously expected to speak within their like area of expertise. And some were absolutely brilliant, <laughs> you should say. I, I remember that, um, for example, um, there was the, uh, uh, Orhan Pamuk, who literally just created the whole, you know, uh, like playwright professional dynamic, speaking to Sofia Andruhovic, who would ask her, like, how you woke up the same day? Were you like literally wearing your pajama while running to the cheap station to the underground to hide in a shelter? And he literally created this, you know, dramatic experience highlight. And some were very, very um, explicit and transparent in terms of their own perception, their, how they feel and perceive the whole situation development. I remember when we were talking to you with Katya Mikhailitsina and Mayo Katakis, and after the official part, he said, like, you made them all look miserable. And I felt it somehow. <laughs> I got to, I needed some time just to get and find my own voice within the whole new situation. Because I think that one of the most challenging part of the whole big invasion was just to believe that this is actually happening. People were in complete denial stage. You don't want to believe that in 21st century, things like get that in the middle of Europe are still happening. So the easiest way was completely to deny. Yeah, to say that, oh, you're exaggerating a bit, <laughs> you are using the situation and all that stuff. And some conversation were like, our guests were in such a tense in between. <laughs> so That's interesting, actually, isn't it? Because it is. people have gone from this can't be happening to and this is broad and you know, not everyone obviously but there's this media attitude to this is extraordinary to this is happening every day and we're going to move on to something else so the obscene and absurd levels of violence against ukraine has now become part of everyday life for the media and it's no longer reported on something that would have been you know front page news you know, missile strikes um, and various things that are going on would have would have dominated the news cycle for many days. Now you'll be lucky to even find a paragraph about them. So you go from that sort of extraordinary, this is new, to this is old and let's move on. But of course, if you're Ukrainian, you cannot do that. It's new and horrific every single day, every hour of every day. And I think that's something, you know, people talk about Ukrainian resilience and we've got NAFO and there's a lot of humor and a lot of energy. But at the same time, it's draining, isn't it? It's draining, it's depressing. And yet you have to come back every day with energy and passion to try and keep it in the news. Yeah, like I can just run you through my diet. This is a like business diary, right? Just to-do lists. It's just last month, okay? Just for you to understand the context. June 27 and 28, it's a book arsenal. I have some meetings scheduled, including my friend, Victoria Melina. 
The next day, she's been affected. On July 1st, Victoria's birth stop. And while preparing a mass service in Ukrainian cathedral, because I was already back in the UK, in London, just to synchronize this with the funeral in Lviv, I received another heartbreaking news. July 2nd, Andriy Hudyma, artist, restaurateur, my good friend from Lviv, he was killed in the battle with the Russian occupiers near Bakhmut. And the old lion publisher house is preparing his book, right? That's supposed to be his first book. And he was like extremely talented guy. And so we are preparing the mass order for two. Edin Brodyavakuenko, because his birthday is the very same day when Victoria actually stopped breathing. Um, we think that we are kind of starting to cope with that. And then July 21st, it's news emerged of the death of Kiev Academy violinist David Yakushin. He volunteered to serve in the Territorial Defense Division. And uh, he took his violin to the front line with him and he regularly played. And there was there, there were incredible videos, you know, just really uplifting your spirit. And he played for the other soldiers who were like no professional soldiers. These are guys who never even thought to become militants to keep their spirits up. July 30, actor, Yevhen Svitlichny, who probably you seen him, he played the role of Karas in Oleksinsov, the film Rina. That movie has uh, had its world premiere at Venice Film Festival in 2021. Also, he killed in battle. The very same. And this is just, this is a month. And this, I can go on and go on. This is one month of my life. And those are only people I knew just in culture. We're not even touching academia. We're not touching businessmen. We're not touching like my schoolmates or other people, right? And this is our reality we have to cope with, to keep with, to, to live with that, right? To commemorate somehow, to give it proper respect. But then also, Obviously, it's very difficult for people from the outside to share such a burden. And I totally understand that. Totally. It is. It is. It's easy to switch off sometimes. People have their own, you know, hassles with work, friends, etc. And uh, many people who, uh, who I know, who know I do the podcast, I've come to realize that they, they don't listen to it anymore unless i point out and say oh we should really you know listen to this and they might do out of deference uh people have, have tuned out and, and tuned into the next thing and this is one of the other challenges isn't it? i'll come to two things i think one is uh identity and historical awareness because russia and ukraine have been going in very different paths you know in the 90s there was this huge opening up of all the world history culture literature films that have been banned and so on and of course, that process happened in both Russia and Ukraine. Many people who are interested in culture suddenly get this huge input of new things. And also at the same time, you're having revelations about history, about the lies that were told, about Stalinism, communism, etc. cetera, um, and starting to find at least a little bit out of what's going on. And that process was, was unfolding across the ex-USSR um, through the 90s. And then something happened. I get the impression that that accelerated in Ukraine and, you know, not just academics and so on, but but, but everyone uh, has an interest in Ukrainian identity and trying to pick out, you know, whether it's their own family's story or the story of their city or people are trying to get to some kind of historical truth, understanding what happened, unpicking the lies from 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 the reality. In Russia, that process ceased in Russia that process actually started to be banned and buried and it's not just sort of censorship I think it's people would self-censor self-censorship that journey absolutely and oh my gosh I, I don't know even where to start here because if you were talking about Ukrainian history and Ukrainian identity there's such a lot of 
and milestones we should refer to. Maybe I will start from Volodymyr Venichenko. I just quoted him at yesterday's rally in London dedicated to Independence Day, we celebrated. And his famous saying is to be a Ukrainian means to be constantly in a state of proving your right to exist. It's not even about identity. <laughs> it's basically about proving your right to exist. And Volodymyr Venichenko, he was a Ukrainian writer and playwright, but also statesman, right? Political activist who served as a first prime minister of the Ukrainian People's Republic. So you are like, okay, that's a 20th century. But no, <laughs> that's not like that because I'm gonna quote another Ukrainian politician no matter how great the Moscow violence uh, is, it doesn't give Moscovites any legal right in Ukraine. Can you guess who was that? That was Philip Orwick, the guy who wrote the very first democratic constitution in the world that dated at 1710. And I believe that the US constitution is 1787, just almost 80 years later, right? And um, he was uh, then in exile hetman of Ukraine. And even in this document, he represents the high of Ukrainian legal political thoughts, but also shows that he just referred to the 90s. In the 90s, there was a big opening rather for the world and the real opening just happening. For us, that's... Uh, our day-to-day -day story. And um, there is very popular thinking that Ukraine, the people keep saying that like Ukraine starts from Maidan, yeah? And I can say like, yes, but it depends on like, what do you mean under Maidan? Because probably like when you say Maidan, uh, like you, you probably refer to the last one, right? To 2013. But for Ukrainians, it's slightly different because obviously the most famous one now, it's a rising date from the failure of Vilnius summit where Ukraine was to sign a union agreement with the European Union, but then it didn't happen immediately. Then young people went to the Maida and it started in November, 2013 peaked in February, then we had those shaming February lows, and uh, it finalized with a death of around 100 people. And all, but over the past three decades, our Maidan, Maidan Nezalezhnosti, the former square of the October Revolution, I should remind, right, mm -hmm. has become a landmark for Ukrainians in the context of uh, our social changes and also our identity because the student strike in October 1990 just before the fall of Soviet Union can be considered as well as the event that laid the foundation for this tradition in modern history modern history but you should uh, dig deeper because that continuity of Ukrainian revolutions has a long story there was San Sofia Square in 1917 and 18, that's the same. Then afterwards, 90s revolution of granite, then orange revolution in 2004, then the revolution of dignity, 2013, 14. But if you go back in the history, Maidan is a format of the decision-making process in Cossack state, in the Parisian siege. <laughs> it's our very native way of making big decisions and holding elections. So I think that somehow we can be called as a nation of Maidans. Like regularly, there are famous jokes that when we have our harvest businesses done, we start in Maidans. And it's interesting, isn't it, that the, what fascinates me endlessly is the survival of that Ukrainian urge to freedom and independence. And then you look at the periods of subjugation, and I think this is impossible for someone in Britain to understand. Um, a lot easier for someone in, say, Scotland and Ireland to understand, actually. Um, but, uh, you know, it goes on for hundreds of years. And it's not just a sort of single 
punctuated step of repression. It's legislation after legislation, invasions, divisions, uh, repressions over many centuries, many instances, to try and rub out this sense of, of independence. And I think one of the big differences seems to be here that Ukraine has managed to preserve that. Belarus, far less so. Um, I mean, it's, it's, it's still there in many people's minds, but it hasn't broken through uh, to achieve freedom. But then you look at the, the regional history, you know, we'll never know what, say, the culture of the Novgorodian Republic would have been, whether that, you know, would have had its own culture or Peskov or somewhere else, whether they wouldn't have also, you know, created or had some independent identity because they were erased and, and never got back up, you know, and, and never retained it. That's a sort of cultural, political genocide. Um, which the expansion of Muscovy has performed over and over and over again. And you, you could say the peoples of Siberia, to an extent, now are so Russified that uh, you don't have this same sort of, you know, urge and energy to independence that Ukraine does. That, for me, is the miracle of how it was preserved and survived, this little sort of flame which now has has been brought back and, and spread right across the country and... Uh, you know, even down into the south and the east and Donbass and those with stronger, you know, roots and uh, mixed families. The, the fire of Ukrainian identity and culture is, is, is spreading and accelerating throughout the country. How do, how do you explain this process? Sorry, it's not really a question, but uh, how do you explain it? You know, when, when you refer to the, like, we don't really know how this would be, I just thought about the other two big painful experiences in Ukrainian history. The first one adds executed renaissance when this is exactly the case, like you have no idea how it would be the other ways, right? Because this is a, like sometimes, like it, sometimes it's called the red renaissance in Ukrainian, it's rastrilane vidrodzhenya. And it's a term to describe that whole generation of Ukrainian-speaking poets, writers, playwrights, intellectuals, artists of the 20s and early 30s who lived in Ukrainian Socialist Soviet Republic and didn't survive. <laughs> First, the official is supported and blossoming because that was a policy of this, you know, like supporting original indigenous languages. <laughs> and they were in the end, victims of Stalinist centralizations. And there was very, very uh, cruel Russification policies when they were mostly persecuted. They were mostly just shot, denied to work, imprisoned in dozen of cases, just shot during the Great Terror. There was like those, uh, like a year and few months between August uh, 37 and November 38. And that would be already enough. That would be already enough to say like, that thing could be different. But then I'm preparing a big article for a Stockholm conference I'm going next week um, about the deportation of U uh, kids from Western Ukraine in uh, 40, the 40s, 50s. And then I just checked on some numbers about the whole of the more and the numbers of the deportations. And I remember the one number just hit me so painfully that Kuban, Ukrainian population, declined from more than 900,000 to just uh, 100, like 150. 150. Can you imagine that? And just, just between uh, 25, 26, and 39 from very various causes. And that's another question, like when people ask, like, what about Ukrainian Holodomor? And when I try to explain, well, there are the 20s, which were like sort of with a kind of natural disease in 21st and 20th to 23rd, and mostly occurred in the Southern Steppe region in Ukraine. But then we had the big Holodomor, which was completely man-made. And this is another huge, and it's literally 10 years later. 
great Ukrainian famine was a completely man-made famine in Soviet Ukraine, right? And it killed, like, we, we don't know how many people. There are no real numbers. We still uh, can't even imagine an effect on demographic. That we only know that, for example, over 35% of Ukrainians in Kazakhstan been lost in 35. Yeah, so when we are just checking some numbers of uh, the population of Ukraine, so if there were years in Ukrainian Soviet Republic to have like 82 millions. How many of us are now? It's like 37, probably there's a very optimistic number. Yeah. Even at the height before, you know, mass emigration of the 90s and 2000s, I think it was 40, 44 is a figure I've yeah. seen, but it's it's been dropping as well through... Uh, it's been, you know. and that, that we had this nice, like, campaign, I don't remember, in 2000s, probably, that NAS 52 million, there are 52 millions of us, but it's never been proven, and then all the numbers went down significantly. So if you just, like, imagine all those people and referring to the case of executed renaissance it's a very special people the most talented people people who would build and develop this ukrainian identity and culture you can't really imagine what the country would be and this is the thing this is a story of ukraine when we need to fight over and over just to prove our right to exist and even in 90s, I'm a kid of Soviet Union. I'm a, I'm born in 81st. So I started, obviously, my school in Russian. There were no English, right? And that it took a while for us just to get into history. During my school years, the history being changed about six times. So no textbooks. And um, I remember 90s, which were like very desperate times to live, especially if you are a teenager. <laughs> Those were very challenging times. There's not much to do, was there? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there were a lot of fun as well, but um, there were definitely not times for the whole country when people could feel that they are safe to unpack their identity. I've been lucky to, you know, to be born in Lviv, it's Western part, but it's a completely different story in Dnipro. Donetsk, right, in Kharkiv even, which used to be our first official uh, capital somehow, right? And these were very different times. Now, last year, we got a lot of newcomers from Ukraine on under the Ukrainian uh, Homes for Ukraine scheme. Officially, I checked a few days ago that the UK gave 160,000 visas. Obviously not all the people came, obviously not all the people stayed. But I should say that I, I'm leading the Ukrainian uh, unit of scouts here in London and in the UK. Half of our kids now are just from, you know, refugees from Bucha, from Dnipro. I was a bit- Marupel and- uh... Uh, f A few of them, we have, uh, uh, we have also the orphan orphanage house in Edinburgh. We are taking care of them and uh, also moved from that area. I was a bit scared about these uh, new kids. First of all, because like I have no professional capacity to work with deeply traumatized kids. Secondly, I was like, do they speak Ukrainian? And this is our official policy as Ukrainian scouts, right? Because of preservation of Ukrainian culture. And they do. <laughs> they actually speak brilliant Ukrainian. That's another myth we need to counter, we need to face, we need to find how to work with it. And uh, as you can see, it even can like be very deeply linked with my own thinking, being Ukrainian, right? And being very open and being caring about these kids. That, that that's right isn't it and this is one of the challenges isn't it of not just uh you know the internal uh understanding of different ukrainians and uh you know the perceived differences it's a problem for the news as well because 
Russia is one massive dumpster fire, isn't it? I mean, it is, it's chaotic, it's it's unpredictable, it's unbelievable most of the time. Just the, the sheer cruelty and ridiculousness of so much that happens in Russia. Um, but it's very newsworthy. The challenge with Ukraine is it's it's normal, it's European, it's civilized. Crazy things don't happen all the time. Um, and, and therefore it's hard to get it onto a news agenda. You know, either it has to be a victim or you know, it's not covered at all. Um, there's no space really in, in the news narrative for a normal yet resilient Ukraine. It doesn't, doesn't fit in to the sort of news process. Whereas it Russia, doesn't. endless, endless headlines because, I mean, we just have to take Prigozhin and the madness there. But you could pick any day of the week and you could be guaranteed uh, extraordinary lunacy coming out of Russia that is extremely newsworthy. What can I say? You know that I faced it a lot, especially at the very beginning of the invasion. Uh, because when I'm being invited as a guest, mostly journalists would totally expect from me to be a victim. They wanted to make me cry. And then afterwards they would ask like, oh, is it true that in Ukraine you eat dumplings all the time? And I was like, oh my goodness. Seriously? Seriously. And then like, you kind of asked, you invited the cultural studies and communication expert, right? And you asking me about dumplings, well, okay, say something, right, about the level of general knowledge. Then when the situation changed a bit, they would absolutely expect everything to be hero stories. This is a big, I don't know, trap for Ukraine because the world, this is a, this is a best documented war in the whole history. Like all the videos, you know, all the protocols like everything is monitored but the thing is that the world kind of expect the hollywood blockbuster effects can't you see that even now like we got your some offense in weapon just give us a show we want a show and we are trapped somehow in between of delivering victim stories or being a hero the best thing obviously to marry both <laughs> and you are totally right that there are no room for normality. There are no room, you know, just to be the normal European, you know, based and whether European democratic values guy, whether, you know, dignity resistance, because it's boring, right? It's boring. It doesn't create that, you know, the yellow pages of a Sun magazine. So, and this is obviously a problem in terms of the, um, you know, the era of uh, TikTok and TikTokers. But we are lucky to have uh, a, our president, the guy who is quite good on the TikTok businesses. Oh. <laughs> I should say that I absolutely genuinely never voted for him. And that was a big personal tragedy for me. <laughs> but as for now, I can say that he's blunt and very genuine also manier of communication like we don't need your sandwiches just give us a weapon or like when i think that the game changing moment was definitely when he were has been proposed to get him off the country right and he said like no i don't need this i need a weapon <laughs> and he's we very good at communicating that. with world leaders isn't he he's very good at picking the moment the right phrase and the right emotion and that that's very powerful. It's not only where the world leaders, I should say that it's not only external politics, but he also like this tradition of uh, um, when they, for example, he has those like late evening talks or like short videos, TikToks, like when he like says what's important through the day, just recorded with a mobile phone, very simple, like, like next door, you know, neighbor guy. And I think what benefits for sure, that's definitely a very professional work. Let's be honest behind of that. Yeah, a lot of speech writers and guys are really good, but the way how he delivered that, 
it's also a masterpiece sometimes. He knows how to be sharp. He knows how to be funny. He knows how and when to push back. So I my think favorite that one. Time... I'll put a link to my favorite one. It's in Ukrainian, but it has subtitles. And uh, oh, great. he's telling an anecdote about two elderly Jews, I think, in Odessa. Sort uh -huh. of like, well, it's war, you know. And uh, one's saying, oh, yeah, I know. Russia's fighting against NATO. And then one of them lists all the losses, the tremendous losses, and says... Well, what, the other one says, well, what's NATO lost? Oh, NATO hasn't turned up yet. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. That's true. And like the last, uh, when the, the, he's been proposed this shaming idea of just, you know, exchanging the territories, right? And when he was like, yeah, Belgorod, <laughs> please take it, right? So, and this is something new and very refreshing in the European politics. Mm. He's not a professional politician, and I think that it made him, actually. And it changed the whole story as well. Is there also a Ukrainian aspect to it? Because it's not just, you know, the president or Padilak or others who have an impatience with the diplomacy and the niceties and the slowness and the etiquette of European and American politics. And, of course, the politics itself, you know, the toxic politics and negotiations, they seem to want to cut through all the BS and just say, right, let's just deal with the facts and let's deal with them quickly and do something about it. After a year and a half, that strikes me as actually quite a quite a Ukrainian characteristic. It is. You know how they used to call me in our pen office like this, how they were brutally honest. That's it. And I think that our politicians are also a mess and this is a quite different world. But in I mean that if we're talking about Ukrainian character and style of doing things, first of all, it's totally different temporality, like totally. And we have a lot of internal jokes uh, with my friends in terms of what does it mean to be um, European, right? There was actually the meme of the last days and then like when Americans saying like we have lower inflation, lower underemployment, higher growth than you, we win again. And then Europeans, including the UK, thanks for your email. I'm currently out of the office on annual summer vacations until 30th of September. <laughs> and this is the answer. For me, that was very challenging when I moved back in 2018 to the UK and working in a sphere of cultural management. So our Ukrainian standard, if you receive request, you in the morning, you're going to repeat answer it by the end of the day. If it's afternoon, next day morning. The UK standard, two weeks. <laughs> right. Also, in terms of delivering things, I remember my first uh, like business emails when I would receive a six long page long email with like here and there, all the things like we are so happy to hear from you, blah, blah, blah. And in the end, you're like reading it again and again. And they said, no, like, what do they mean? And it's like, why can't you just say it straightforward? After five years passed, when anyone just sent me an email like, hey, this is an issue, like mostly my American or Ukrainian colleagues, I'm like, I have been so rude. Where are all those pages I expect from you? Where's well, like, all the fluff and the lang, you know, the pointless language to it? Prepare yeah, you for the This is a culture news. standard for sure. For yeah. sure. We have a lot of jokes around that. Absolutely. So and of course, totally wartime right. accelerates that. The need to do stuff and do it quickly, the need to take action rather than just talk about things. That seems to have, have accelerated that Ukrainian characteristic to see a problem, not wait around for someone to resolve it and say, OK, how can I solve this? How can I fix this thing that I've now become aware of and I can't move on and do anything else until I figure out how to fix this thing? That seems to me, and this is why I created the channel, it seems to me that there is both an attitude and a methodology that Ukrainians have developed for incredibly powerful civic society as a problem solving and engine of innovation. 
that could solve social problems, but it's also solving political problems. It's innovating ways to tackle propaganda, propaganda techniques, propaganda narratives. And I think it's desperately important for the US and Europe and, and the UK, especially post-2016, to start understanding how we make our own societies more resilient. And that's the endless frustration that uh, the importance of this topic isn't quite getting through to everybody and the urgency of it. What can I say? You know, we are coming from very different cultural backgrounds. Like we can't afford to stay on the stage of uh, reflection and discussion sometime. Uh, you should like understand that, especially now, now it's very, very explicit that I do work in between of the UK and Ukraine. And those are sometimes maybe two different universe. Like logistically, obviously it's a nightmare because if earlier you would just jump, you know, to the plane in Stansted and land in Lviv or Kiev within three or four hours. Now it takes like 24 to 48 hours, depending on borders, tickets. Sometimes you can stop on the border for 12 hours or can cross five feet. Also risky, but still an option. But mentally, it's completely different universe. It's such a different experience. You can't imagine until you live it out. Ukraine always has been very vivid, but now it's kind of an extreme experience. I remember that you probably can recall that when African politicians delegation were, were complaining that there is nothing like war happening. People, people keep living their lives, right? They do. They go to work, no matter what's happening, like Chernobyl, the war, a nuclear disaster. And what, what do you do on Monday? Go into the office. <laughs> they send kids to school. They fall in love. They plan kids. They visit cinemas, restaurants, and theaters. And from the external perspective, it can look weird or even annoying, right? But you should understand that going to work, they check if everything is sorted the way they will never come back or sending kids to school, they double check if bomb shelter functioning well, even then mobiles, power banks, additional snacks, untouchable reserve, right? If they need to spend longer time in shelters and it's happening quite regularly or they get married to be able to identify the body, excuse me or make medical decisions in critical situations, because otherwise it's going to be challenging or impossible, or because they simply know that there can be no another chance or even another day. So basically, it's like living in between of two completely different universes. And in Ukraine, you live like this is your last day. And this is not a metaphor. <laughs> That's the reality, and people have to adjust to it. Like, if it's my last day, why shouldn't I go to the restaurant, right? Why shouldn't I enjoy the food <laughs> or friends or cinema, right? But still, I need to be prepared. And each time, I personally, when I go to Ukraine, I have a quite difficult conversations with my daughter when she's like, you should be aware. I'm a kid. You're responsible. You have to be very safe and careful. And... And I feel extremely privileged that I can move out of Ukraine any moment I want, right? And I can visit it. I can come back home, switch off rocket alarms and enjoy peaceful life. Sometimes I even feel guilty because of that too, I can't deny. But this is a very existential experience. I would never miss it. <laughs> but it changes your perception and including this temporality. I mean, we can't, afford for things and actions to take too long because the context is always changing and it must help that you have a purpose you have a job and a role and that role is enhancing you know ukraine's perception of ukraine and the world that has a direct impact on gaining you know military support alliances and uh, and equipment you know the the, the more people empathize with ukraine the better it is or will be for the supply of uh, munitions. So that must help a little bit, having that kind of structure and purpose. 
Yeah, it does. <laughs> it does because you understand what you're fighting, what you're getting tired for, for something what you can't really, you know, evaluate in money. It can sound a bit old school for the Western world, but it just because of the ages of comfort of being yourself. But we are fighting what like what has no price. <laughs> yeah, because this is your motherland and you can really you can't um you can say like okay i'm taking a day off from this even when we are going to like we already came to the point that yes we need to recover our resources time to time but you never off the grid and you always change in news right but just as we, we just were speaking about a few pages of ukrainian history we never had this luxury of being in comfort of being ourselves um since Kiev Rus times, I guess. So you're gonna you're gonna grasp onto that and not let it go now. I think that is the impression I get. Well, I think we could probably talk for many, many more hours, <laughs> and hopefully this is the first of of, uh, of of many such conversations. I think there's so many topics we didn't even come to the sort of formal questions we shared uh, because there's there's so much to sort of talk about. Um, I'm very grateful to you for spending time on this on uh, on the channel, sharing uh, your your extraordinary experiences and expertise with the audience. And of course, Ukrainian Independence Day was yesterday. I think it's very fitting that we end talking about Ukraine and talking about the preservation and resilience of Ukrainian identity. So happy belated uh, Independence Day! Well, we had. Um big rally near St. Paul Demers and that it was like all the Ukrainian diaspora organization would be involved like Euromaidan SOS, OGB, PLAS, Ukrainian Scouts, Zoom, all the communities, obviously Ukrainian church, all the churches, Orthodox, Catholics, like everyone and all the artists, singers and everything and People just like Ukrainian likes gathering, and at the end of the day, they just uh, turning everything into the big celebration. It's always gonna end up with everybody singing, kind of national karaoke, and like a lot of food sharing, also laughing, but remembering the people we lost over the last year. But we were talking about like Ukrainian resilience tools, and I just. Uh, remember, we were about to speak about Ukrainian humor, <laughs> and that probably one of the really a uh, nice task I really enjoyed over the last year when we were preparing the rallies on Downing Street and Trafalgar Square. I was uh, responsible for the screen deliveries, and obviously, a lot of times there would be like short videos just showing what's going on and everything. But my favorite part there was. Um, definitely the part of i call the section memes of the victory because <laughs> actually they all this you know like humor as an incredible coping mechanism and i think that especially for ukrainians it's part of this cultural code as well like poker face jokes has been always part of our mindset and i think that you're familiar with all of the memes like funny stories about drones knocked down by the jar of calls from a balcony or tank stoned by gypsy guys or an old woman who urged uh, uh, the occupiers to put seeds in their pockets right and there are plenty of those memes and uh, I've always felt sorry that I have no enough time just to analyze them properly but I keep collecting and this is in, and we keep laughing at ourselves because of that like the uh, news of the day before independence on Prihozhin yeah one of the funniest meme about ourselves were like, here I am keeping two folders, memes prepared if he has been actually killed and if he is not. <laughs> it's, and within an hour after releasing any news, especially Twitter just explodes with all those memes, right? Even our official institutions accounts on Twitter. I'm loving them. <laughs> it's such an irony and bright and sharp humor. And I think that this is a great coping mechanism, actually, and uh, that's uh, something what can absolutely to be added to the list of how we succeed. <laughs> what are the ways of our resilience? And we're back to the beginning, how we survive, 
and how we succeed. And that's uh, two incredibly important topics. Yeah, it'd be good to unpack those in another another episode, definitely. Um, absolutely. Olga, thank you so much. It's been absolutely brilliant. And um, yeah, I know the audience are going to sort of uh, love this video. And I re really appreciate you spending your, your precious time to... Uh, to share that with us. My pleasure, just sent me a link and I add a lot of fresh memes. <laughs> <laughs>